All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Alan Jagelinzer. I'm the professor of financial accounting at the University of Cambridge Judge Business School. And I want to welcome, to, welcome you to tonight's discussion of the psychology of fraud featuring Sam Antar, whom we will introduce in a few minutes. First, um, we're going to host our questions from you at slido.com's hashtag accounting fraud. Right, good evening, everybody. I'm so, Alan Jagelinzer. I'm the professor of financial accounting at the So if you have any questions, please run them over to slido.com hashtag accounting fraud. So the University of Cambridge Master of Accounting program is hosting this, this session tonight, and we're hosting a, ser a series of evening webinars with world leaders um, in business. And tonight's a different one because we're dealing with fraud and part at least because we're trying to, to develop global ethical leaders for leadership roles in accounting finance and related fields. Tonight, we're gonna to be hosted with Sam Antar, uh, hosting Sam Antar, who's a convicted felon and the former CFO of Crazy Eddie for a moderated discussion of why some professionals commit white collar fraud and what incentives and infrastructure help foster and sustain fraud. I'm joined tonight with, by Burton Shawwell Jr., who is the Asia representative in Hong Kong for the British Virgin Islands Financial Services Commission Regulator. And Burton is also one of our students enrolled in the Cambridge Master of Accounting program, and he will help us co-moderate tonight. Part of why we're doing this is related to some of the research that's been done by colleagues of ours, including Eugene Soltis, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School. And he has asked in his book, why do they do it? Why do white collar criminals do it? And he has gone and interviewed many white collar criminals, including Bernie Madoff and, and some of the more famous white collar criminals to try to understand what compels them to do it. What's the psychology? Some of what he's learned in his, in his interviews with them is that it's not always rational. Um, in this particular incident, there was a big four partner who tipped off somebody on insider trading and it only generated 1,500 US dollars of value to him. Uh, even though it was completely illegal. And this was a gentleman who was earning almost $1 million a year in annual income. And that to him, in, in to, to Professor uh, Soltis, wasn't rational. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. And so one of the things he learned was it never really, that some of these people never really thought about the consequences and that it was something beyond just financial gain um, that was motivating to do this. Likewise, one of the reasons why I've invited Sam Antar out as a guest lecturer to my classes, despite the fact that he often uh, comes in from a perspective that I'm not comfortable with, and in, in some cases is quite provocative, is because uh, there's a clinical psychologist who's written a book called Inside the Criminal Mind, who fundamentally says that we don't understand how the criminal thinks. Uh, I know that there's research about the way that their brain operates that suggests that they, they actually just think differently. And it's very difficult for people who follow rules to understand how people or why people don't follow the rules. And I think it's quite important that we hear from them to get a sense for how they think and why they think the way they do. To be clear, I don't necessarily condone what we're gonna hear tonight. Um, it is not representative of our program in any specific way, but this is at least a, a reflection into why people might do white collar crime. So a little bit about Crazy Eddie, it's best known for their crazy commercials, which were running um, all the time in, uh, in the New York City area market. Get a color TV for Christmas or a portable TV. Get a TV for Christmas now because Crazy Eddie's Christmas sale is going on right now with prices so low he's practically giving TVs away. Shop around, check all the advertised specials, get the best prices you can find, then go to Crazy Eddie and he'll beat them. So get a TV for Christmas, get it now. Because and so it was a very popular electronics discounter uh, franchise that ran throughout the New Jersey and New York area primarily. And some of the things they got involved with include sales tax skimming, money laundering, revenue manipulation, bogus inventory, false advertising, bait and switch sales, deceiving and distracting auditors. And they went public and of course their stock price plummeted and, um, and Sam will tell you the rest of their story as he goes along. So I'm gonna to introduce tonight Sam Antar, who is, as I mentioned, a convicted felon. He's a former uh, CPA. He and his cousin Eddie created Mastermind, one of these securities frauds. And I told you a little bit about the kinds of things he did. Um, and so he's gonna tell a little bit of his, of his story and using some of his slides, and then we're gonna open up and Burton's gonna ask some questions. And I wanna remind you again, that if you have questions, please submit them via slido.com, hashtag accounting fraud. Sam, thank you for coming. Sam, I think you're muted. 
Thank you for having me on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, would you like me to begin? Okay, let's start with just a gen gen some general things about white collar crime. Uh, in my slide, for instance, white collar crime is more brutal than violent crime. All too often, the focus of, of crime is on the violent criminals, not the white collar offenders. In fact, white collar offenders become celebrities like myself. Um, would you have, for instance, on your program now a serial killer that was talking about how that person just you know, uh, chopped up bodies and put them in refrigerators? Of course not. But white collar criminals kind of get a pass, but white collar criminals are much more brutal than than violent criminals. The actions of a few white collar criminals can cause far more collective harm on society. Look at Bernie Madoff. The actions of Bernie Madoff and just a handful of co-conspirators cause $50 billion in excess of damages to, to people. Um, to, to commit our crimes, we use a combination of persuasion and deceit. In other words, white collar crime is a personal crime. We have to be able to manipulate people's behavior. And in order to do that, I call, I call, I call it exploitable weaknesses. We take advantages of people's exploitable weaknesses. For example, white collar criminals use a combination of persuasion and deceit to achieve their objectives. We prey on the psychological and cognitive vulnerabilities of our victims using the following techniques. We consider your humanity, your ethics, your needs, your desires, your morality and good nature as weaknesses to be exploited in the execution of our crimes. Your ethics, your morality limits your behavior but does not limit the behavior of the white collar criminal. So the more ethical and good natured you are, the easier it is for a white collar criminal to take advantage of you, exploit you and commit their crimes. The second rule is, White collar criminals measure their effectiveness by the comfort level of their victims. They use a combination of fraud and deceit to achieve their objectives. You can steal more with a smile than with a gun. The people that are most likely to disappoint you in life, to take advantage with you in life are the people that you like because when you like somebody, you're less likely to think that they're lying to you. The third, exploitable weakness that white collar criminals take advantage of is that we fabricate false integrity to gain the trust of our victims. False integrity means like this, uh, a priest, a rabbi, a cleric, uh, a mullah, uh, a religious leader, a teacher, the head of a Boy Scout troop. Uh, white collar criminals try to put themselves in positions where people are less likely to question their behavior. Like take, for instance, the Catholic Church. There's a lot of cases where, where priests have, have, have sexually uh, uh, exploited and abused young little boys. And people say, is it the Catholic Church's fault? Of course not, it's not. White collar criminals want to be priests because their, 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 their behavior is less likely to be questioned and because they are more likely to be respected. And it puts them in a position that makes it easier to commit their crimes. As white collar criminals, we will always have the tactical advantage to commit our crimes. As I said before, your morals, your ethics, your good nature, limit your behavior, but fraudsters have no constraints on their behavior. The ethical foundation of our society is based on trust and the legal basis of our society is based on the presumption of, in of innocence. The inclination to trust and the presumption of innocence gives the fraudster the initial benefit of any doubt while they are free to plan and execute their crimes. For instance, I'm talking to you out of my apartment. The government can't just knock down the door and come in here if I'm planning my next heist. I have rights as an individual. I have the presumption of innocence on my side. And any criminal has that same presumption of innocence on their side. Therefore, trusting and decent law-abiding human beings are easier prey for white-collar criminal because you are limited by your morals and ethics. White collar criminals are not limited because they don't have any morals and ethics. In other words, your morals, your ethics, and your good nature make it easier for white collar criminals to prey on you.
would you like to continue as answer any questions or would you like me to get into the crazy Eddie fraud? Let's, uh, yeah, we can go into, so we're gonna ask questions on Sato.com and then we can move into Burton's questions. Burton, okay, um, we have one question on Slido. Sam, what are your thoughts on Tesla? I'm not gonna hear to talk about uh, public companies and uh, help day traders make money on stocks. Okay, so I'll move into my first question. Sam, what motivated you and your family to engage in the crimes at Crazy Eddie? Greed, money, power, and the sheer fun of it. Was this something that you set out to do or were you groomed the crazy into- Eddie fraud. Yes, uh, the Crazy Eddie fraud was a premeditated fraud from day one. We didn't go into business and then commit crime. We went into business to commit crime. Initially, we, Crazy Eddie's was, was a garden variety tax evader. Back in the 1970s and late 60s and early 80s, most customers paid in cash and New York charged a very high percentage of sales tax. So if you can not report the cash, skim the cash, right? You would not only be able to steal the sales tax, which was in those days was six or seven percent of sales, which is a sizable number, but you also be able to evade your income taxes, which was also a sizable number back in those days before the Reagan tax cuts. And using that cash, you can pay people off the books and evade or avoid paying payroll taxes. So the economics of Crazy Eddie was based upon screwing the United States government, both state, local, and federal governments. So I have that a question. That gave us the competitive advantage. So, you know, financial statements are under audit and we're teaching audit sort of policy in our coursework. What's There's no your, such thing as audits, but go ahead. Yeah, so what's your perspective on audit and what could be fixed? Does it work? There's Why no doesn't it work? There's no such thing as audits. Audits as they are defined today are not really audits. In fact, it's a misleading term. What, what, what public accounting firms do today is equivalent to what you do with your, your, your Microsoft Word program with the speller, the spell and grammar check. All they do is look for, all they look for is, um, is, 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 is very, very obvious things that would normally stick out. They don't really go in deep and, and, and go deep into the numbers. That's why short sellers are much, much better at finding fraud than, than, than auditors, because they look at patterns of numbers, they look, they analyze numbers better. And for, furthermore, short sellers even go more deeply because they look for the three X's, X lovers, X business associates, and X employees to, to rat out management. Auditors can't do those things. So auditors are limited in their tools. In fact, also you have another problem, which is the, which is the culture of the accounting profession. They never call the companies, they audit targets. They call them clients. So how can you audit somebody that's your client? You know, that, that, that's the culture. So how is it that the auditors didn't catch your fraud? Because I was smarter than them. <laughs> I never lost an audit because this, in, in, when it comes to fraud, the distraction is always more important than the law. So audits would normally take about eight weeks to do a crazy edit. The auditors would come in and take about eight weeks. By week four out of eight, they're expected to have 50% of their work done, 50% of their work left to do. By week six out of eight, they're expected to have 75% of their work done and 25% of their work left to do. My job was to reverse things. By week six out of eight, instead of having 75% of their work done and 25% of their work left to do, they had 25% of their work done and 75% of their work left to do. So in the remaining 25% of the time, they had to do 75% of their work, which is triple the amount of work. Now, how was I able to do it? You see, you don't want to be accused of stonewalling. You don't want to be accused of, 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 uh, of not being cooperative with the auditors. So there was the same. The distraction is always more important than the why. I engaged in the distraction technique. Every time an auditor would come into Crazy Eddies to work, and in those days, it was the 1980s, there were very few females in auditing. Most of the people doing the legwork on audits were young males between 25 and 30 years old, single. I would pair them with a nice, hot looking, sexy looking female. And they'd be more distracted trying to get to first base with the females and doing their jobs. That's pretty much how I did it. Work 
year after year after year after year after year. The auditors, I took the auditors to strip clubs. I took them to buy, I bought them lap dances, anything, whatever. Anything that they, they, they loved me more than they did love their work. And as a result, they didn't pay attention to the details of their work. And, and, at, and by the time they, they were ready to finish the audit, they didn't have most of their work done. Then they rushed to complete their work and they missed very key audit procedures year after year after year. So if you were in a position to fix audit and, and if we had you in an audit policy course, what would you change? What would I change? First of all, stop putting young children on audits. I'm 63 years old, I'm allowed to be an ageist. Stop putting young kids on audits. We have to start manning audits with, with veterans, people with gray hair, bald heads, et cetera. That's what we have to start doing. We need people with more experience. Right now, audits are training grounds, kind of like boot camp for kids entering the profession trying to get their CPA licenses. or just starting out in public accounting firms. We don't have enough veterans on the ground doing audit work. We need more experienced people. Sam, um, we have a few questions coming in on Slido. I'm just gonna choose one randomly. Someone is asking, how enjoyable was it when you were committing those crimes? Oh, it was great. I loved every single minute. Of course it had its challenges. You had good days, you had bad days. No different than anybody at work. For me, crime was just the normal way of life. Um, another participant is asking, did you have a set milestone in terms of wealth that if met, you would have considered conducting the business legally? No, no, no criminal finds, go no criminal finds God or finds morality when they achieve their goals. For me, crime was a way of life. Let me get back into the whys. You see, there are two types of criminals in this world. The people where crime is a way of life, we'll call them the hardcore criminals. And the people that have that momentary lapse in judgment, the people that have that momentary lapse in judgment, they never set out to commit crime in the first place. They open their businesses, things happen, they make a mistake, they, they're under pressure, they, 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 they fall into crime. For us, the crazy Eddie Fraud says crime was a way of life. Our crimes were premeditated. For us, our normal was screwing over people, screwing over investors, evading taxes, screwing over insurance companies. Anything that we can do to, to anything we can do to make money, break break or bend any rules, that's what we did or tried to do. So do you think it's easier now or harder now to commit fraud? Because we've had a bunch of acts that have been passed and now there's like the over here we've got the Financial uh, Reporting Council looking into audit reform and stuff like that, Sarbanes Oxley in the United States. Is it easier or more difficult now to commit fraud, do you think? I think it I I, I don't think it's any more difficult or any more easier. I just think that people will always be people and people will always be gullible and vulnerable. Sam, in, I've been looking online at some of your interviews and I know you, you mentioned about the fraud diamond. We're getting a question on Slido. Do you think the fraud triangle, so opportunity incentive and rationalization that is often taught to auditors. Is that a useful tool? No, rationalization is all bullshit as far as I'm concerned. There was no rationalization for my crimes. Let's go back. Criminals, opportunities. Criminals need the opportunity to commit their crime. That's part one of the four triangle. What was the other part, part two? Opportunity. Yeah. Opportunity, right. incentive, and of course, rationalization. Of course, incentive is... You know, what's the end game to commit crime? Number three is criminals try to rationalize it. We didn't rationalize our crimes. We, I didn't go to sleep at night saying, oh, I did the wrong thing. Oh, I'm gonna go to hell. Oh, I hurt all these people. For us, I was amoral as that was concerned. I just committed my crimes. We were cold blooded in the way that we committed. There was no rationalization whatsoever. Maybe rationalization comes into place. We have that criminal that falls into crime because of momentary lapse in judgment. But the hardcore criminal where crime is a way of life, there's no rationalization. We do it because we can. And if I was to give you one simple sentence as to why I did my crimes at Crazy Eddie and why my co-conspirators did it, we did it simply because we could. So why are you here tonight? And do you feel sorry for this? Because one of the questions that comes in is, do people who get caught feel sorry? And like, yeah, what's your whole purpose of, all, of coming in? First of all, we're sorry we got caught. Of course, I was sorry that I got caught. Second of all, I can tell you I feel sorry, but does it really make a difference? Can you How elaborate? That, like, in other words, do you want, do you, 
is it is it my goal to make you fall asleep at night saying, oh, don't worry, Sam Antal's not going to commit more crime? I mean, I could convince you that I feel sorry, and I convince you that I don't feel sorry. It's an irrelevant item whether I feel sorry or not. That's people trying to look for closure. People got to get used to the fact that they got to live without closure. Certain people's intentions, no matter what they say, are unknown, and you will never know my intentions. So do you feel sorry? Okay, I feel sorry. I feel bad. <laughs> I don't know if I trust that answer. Good. You shouldn't. That's the point. You know, the Wall Street Journal interviewed like seven or eight convicted felons several years ago and did an article. And they asked every single one whether they would commit crime again. And every single one said, I feel sorry. I committed my crimes. I'll never do it again. And I was the only one that says, well, maybe I might go back again. You never know. Sam, you never know what anybody's going to do. Sam, um, another question that came in. Do you think the behavior that you described about audits, auditors and clients in the 1980s, do you think that that could still happen today? They happen all the time. OK, companies, com companies continually commit fraud and people get caught. OK, and a lot of people don't get caught. Look at General Electric recently. They were fined two hundred million dollars by the Securities and Exchange Commission. All right. General Electric. OK, audited by I think they were audited by KPMG, if I'm not mistaken, which is probably which is crazy. Eddie's auditors. Anyway, but General General Electric, General Electric, two hundred million dollars. Uh, the, 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 the SEC brought charges against uh, Robin Hood, that app with the stock. Crime is always going to happen. Crime is part of the human condition. It's always going to be people looking to break the rules and think that they can accomplish it. So the question I have then, how can regulators and other law enforcement agencies be more effective at deterring accounting fraud and other white collar crimes? Well, we could, we, if we want to revise, the, we want to re reform the legal system and get rid of the presumption of innocence, crime will be a lot easier to catch. The problem is, is that criminals have rights. And the presumption of innocence, the basis of our legal system in America, which is probably the best legal system in the, in the world, okay, is the presumption of innocence. And the presumption of innocence not only protects the innocent, but it also protects the guilty. In other words, the best that you can hope to do is to limit crime and to catch a, a sizable portion of the crooks, but you're never going to stop white collar crime. Everybody Everybody is capable of committing crimes. Every there's not one person that's listening to this broadcast here that hasn't that had that that, that 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 that's without sin. We all live with sin and temptation. So so I, I have a question because every time I every time I study this kind of level of crime, it takes so many people to get engaged. How what binds them all? Is it is it because they've got black, they're blackmailed or or like, I mean, because you were a family well, there's business. Different reasons, there's different reasons for different criminal groups. The Crazy Eddie criminal group, which I would call an organized crime group, we were binded by race, religion, ethnicity, and family. In other words, the core of the group was Eddie Antar's immediate family. The secondary core, which was me, which was as a CFO, was Eddie Antar's first cousins and uncles. The third core was people that shared the same ethnicity Syrian Jewish, but we're not part of the family. And then, then you have people that shared the same religion, but not the same ethnicity. And then you had people that neither shared the same religion nor the same ethnicity, but they were friendly with people at the top. So pretty much it was like a system that was based upon uh, by bloodline or your relationship to somebody within the bloodline. So, but but in this case, so it was sort of ingrained in sort of the social DNA and the cultural DNA of the of the family. Is that was that enough? Because I have to imagine that at some point you got to be worrying that somebody on the periphery is going to rat you out at some point, right? How do you no, keep track this, of all that? This is not a two hour movie where you where you're able to vet out somebody in five minutes on a two hour movie. This is a crime that takes place over twenty years, so you're vetting people for weeks, for months before you you pull them into in, in, into the criminal conspiracy. And what kind of tests would you run with them? 
How would you test well, whether you, they're going to? Well, you'd see, you'd interact. There are certain people you know that are that could, that, 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 that 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 would be that you would want to be as part of your conspiracy, and that would be reliable co-conspirators and speak something to people that won't. It's no different than running a business or or finding a partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do you find them? How do, like, what signals are you getting? Because I mean, we we kind of want to know the psychology. So how do I identify who, who's well, going to people that are up? people that are people that are comfortable with dishonesty. But now, of do, course, it doesn't matter certain, why, though, in or certain cases, we're all comfortable with dishonesty because all of us that get into a car, have, have, there's not one person that's gotten into a car that hasn't uh, broken the speed limit or something like that. But it, it depends upon the, the extent and nature that people are, this, are uncomfortable. I mean, it depends upon the extent and nature that people are comfortable with dishonesty. So one quick follow-up from, from Slido. Somebody asked, would, would you, if the fraud were still going, would you have brought your children into it? Probably not. Why? Because I didn't want my I didn't want my uh, children or my uh, immediate family, my immediate family, my personal immediate family, to be involved in it. That's why I never discussed any of my crimes with my former spouse or with any of my, my kids. Were, were very young at the time, so there was no there was no discussing it with them. Okay, thank you. I have one question, Sam. So. This brings us back to this question. Why do people commit accounting fraud when they know it will eventually catch up to them? Um, how did you go about managing the risk of being caught? How did you mitigate well, that all, given? Let's get go to ahead. management. It's a multi-sided question. Let's just break it down before you get to the rest of the plots, okay? First yeah. of all, as a criminal, I didn't cheat myself out of getting a very good education. As recently, I think there was a cheating scandal at one of the universities in Chicago, something like that. I don't know. Okay. My family sent me to school to major in accounting to help them commit more sophisticated crimes in the future. Okay. So what I did was I majored in accounting at Brew College. I got straight A's in accounting. The second I finished college, I took the CPA exam and passed all the four parts with a 91 average at a time that... 80% of the people failed the CPA exam in any given sitting. And the 20% that passed, most of them passed it with just a 75. I passed it with flying colors because my family believed in education. So, so you can, education not only benefits people that are not criminals, but benefits people that are criminals because it helped make our crimes easier to execute. So I'm gonna- More parts of that question, go ahead. Oh, are you, Bart, did you have a follow-up? No, I'll turn it over to you, Adam. Okay, cool. So I, you know, I'm really, really interested in your perspective on enforcement, and I'm going to put it in the context, not so much of your enforcement, because I know that you particularly did not go to jail, but I'm more interested in the bank crisis, if we can go there for a moment. So in the bank crisis, you have the systemic issue that hits the entire world, and you've got smoking gun emails running through banks about some of the fraud that they committed. Why don't we see more enforcement? What's your perspective on that? Because we've turned prosecutors into meter maids. That's what we've done. In the back in my day, okay, uh, Michael Chertoff was the prosecutor in the Crazy Eddie case, and the other guy, Paul Weissman, was the assistant prosecutors. These guys were relentless. They were they were MF, MF never mind. Uh, they were relentless in what they did. Now I say that out of respect, not, not to criticize them. They, their job was to put criminals in jail. And the only reason why I avoided prison is because they flipped me to cooperate so they could put other people more important to them in prison. Today, we've turned prosecutors into media maids. We, we've effectively created a tax on crime in the form of fines to major corporations. Over 200 billion, billion dollars was paid out in fines as a result of the financial crisis. Not one key financial executive went to jail. To, you know, the old day, there used to be a saying, prosecutors can indict a ham sandwich. Today, they couldn't, in, they couldn't indict uh, a ham sandwich being sold as kosher pastrami. They couldn't do it today. So that gets and back as to a my- result, as a result, And as a result, it creates, it creates the atmosphere that the worst case scenario is you just pay the fine, you say you're sorry, you wait a few years, and you start all over again. So yeah, you're okay. saying, yeah, good. So, sorry, Alan, so you're saying, Sam, that the consequences are not proportionate or dissuasive to the- No, the, course, the consequences are not proportionate. Absolutely not proportionate. So what, 
So what direction do you think? I mean, in my case, I avoided prison because I cooperated. I showed them where the bodies were buried. They never would have recovered most of the money if it wasn't for me. I'm not trying to praise myself. I did. I gave them this cooperation to avoid prison, not because I found the light. Okay, but now any schmuck can avoid prison. So do you they're think not that if people in prison? So do you think if enforcement action was taken against? directors and members of the board specifically that would discourage white collar crime specifically it when might, no, it would discourage most it would discourage one set of criminals which is where most of the criminals come from the people that make the momentary lapse in judgment criminals the hardcore criminals it won't discourage but the but but i would say about three quarters of the criminals where uh, they don't set out to commit crime. People that commit crime because they're under pressure, they make stupid mistakes. Uh, they, they have that, you know, they have that momentary uh, weakness in, in, their, in their judgment, their morality. It would discourage those people. But people like myself, it wouldn't discourage. Okay. Okay. People like I was, it wouldn't discourage. Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to throw a hypothesis out there based on what I see in out there right now. I mean, do you, do you suspect that some of this lack of prosecution is because of the allegations that organized crime has sort of infiltrated some governments around the around the world? No, or? no, no. It's because people are lazy, including our government. It's because white collar cases are not simple cases to prosecute. They most of these cases are based upon tons of circumstantial evidence, not direct evidence, not a specific smoking gun and, and prosecutor and because of all because uh, uh, prosecutors don't want to devote the kind of resources it takes to effectively prosecute white collar crimes and put people in prison but don't they just need one don't they need just one informant like you i mean because you basically were the evidence correct if i understand well or you presented the all the evidence because i destroyed all of the evidence and i was and whatever evidence was left over was in my possession but but why did, but why did they turn deal. you i mean because because you just you just got done saying that, that that the prosecutors don't have the leverage to get the evidence they need or they don't have the capability but i mean if they put pressure on people like you then they they presumably do right well that was the old way of doing that used to fl it's called flipping people like they they, they they get the smaller fish to catch the bigger fish to catch the bigger fish to catch the whale they don't do that They're, it's not done as much anymore you know, there's been very, very few people going to jail for accounting fraud, the kind of fraud that I did, the cooking the books. Very few people, if any. Today, what they do, they're doing inside pre what's his name, Barara, how do you pronounce it? Uh, yeah, yeah he's, he's everybody the former... thinks he was a great prosecutor. He was not a great, he did insider trading cases, which are relatively easy to prosecute versus accounting fraud, which takes a lot more resources. Burton, you have a follow up? You know, I would say, I would go as far as to say this any fraudster today that accomplishes their crimes should have an asterisk attached to their names because today we live in the golden era of white collar crime. Is that, any, is schmuck, any schmuck can avoid prison today. I mean, also, can you if, elaborate? If I to do it, if you would ask me, would you do crime again? If I were to do crime all over again, I should have waited 30 years to do it today because I would, I would, could have even avoided house arrest. So why? So that goes back to, I think, a question that we asked earlier. Do you think it's easier to commit crime now than it was when you were doing it, based on the statement that you just made? Well, e easier and consequences are two different things. I think that the consequences are far less than they were when I was doing crime. Easier, I think it's just probably just about as easy. I don't know if it's more easier or less easier, but I think it's just about the same. But the consequences are far less. And the consequences mean that more people will take the risk to do crime because they know that they're not going to go to prison. So, do you, so, so we're getting into the psychology, back into psychology. I've got somebody asking off Slido, do you think you have to be a psychopath to do this? Is that, is that what we're no. dealing with? No, you just have to be, you have, you have to be. Are, are, you, a son? are you a psychopath? Criminal. Are you a psychopath? So. Who knows? Maybe, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, you have to be you have to be rational as far as your choices in my cases in my case in the crazy eddie case we graduated we started from smaller crimes we built on smaller successes we took more and more chances we built we built upon previous successes to get to where we were but sam previously you said rationalization is bs so how does that change now based on what you're saying what do you mean Previously, when, when someone asked about... Yeah, rationalization the, the, the is BS for, 
for the career criminal. For the person that makes the momentary lapse in judgment, there is rationalization. But for the career criminal, the hardcore criminal, rationalization is BS. Okay. But, but, so, but earlier, and now I'm going to follow up, because earlier you had said that you don't care, you hurt all these other people. I mean, don't you have to at least be sociopathic where you literally just don't care about the damage you're doing? I mean, there's massive wreckage, as you described, to all kinds of people. There's lots of stakeholders at risk. And I mean, don't you have to be sociopathic and just say, yeah, screw them, I don't give a crap. I mean, like... I'm not a psychologist, so I don't, you know, I, I don't give diagnosis. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Yes. Let me ask you this. Did you care about the harm you were doing while the crime was going on? Did that no. ever factor in? You had no guilt no, during that. Not stage. one sleepless night. And did that? Not and one this conversation. Is a, and this is a question that came off slide. Did that roll over into all of the other facets of your life? So the attitude of, I can do whatever the hell I want. Did that sort of spill no, over? No, that's not true. No, no, no. I, there were other facets of my life. I was a father. I cared about my children. I cared about my former spouse. You know, there were things that I did care about. But as far as when it came to crime, I didn't care. Sam, are you still a criminal? You'll never know, even if I said no. <laughs> Alan, do you have a follow-up? See, when people ask a question like that, okay, Let's say I gave them yes for an answer. How does that solve any problem? We're talking, we're talking from an educational point of view. I could tell you, okay, I'm not a criminal anymore. Okay, does that make you feel good? Does that make you feel good at night? Does it make you go to sleep at night? It, it, it's it a goes, relevant question. It, it's it, a question. No, actually, actually, it is because it goes back to the point. Do you ever, have you ever felt any remorse or having committed these crimes, do Again, you think that there... Uh, well, if I we're talking you, about if this I, psychology. If I told you, if I told you, I felt remorse. How does that change anything? Are you are you here to feel good about Sandy Antar, or are you here to learn about crime? Because well, I can tell to you, learn. I have remorse. Let's put it this way: the very fact that I'm here and I'm sharing with you the sins of my life. Name anybody that's listening to this program that is willing to get on camera and share all the dirty, dark deeds that they did. So you tell me what's remorseful and what's not remorseful. Just saying you're remorseful is meaningless. It's your actions that dictate your remorse. It's how you account for your prior actions, how you describe them in the brutal honesty to which you did them. That's how you, that's how you, that's how, that's how you, that, that's how you judge remorse. Not by saying, I feel sorry. Not by saying, by crying on a screen. Not by writing letters of apology. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question that comes off Slido, and, and it relates to something you said. You seem, when you, when you discuss things like prosecution and government, and in your prior discussion, you'd mentioned that you, you guys originally intended to screw the government because you were stealing taxes and stuff like that. What's your view of the government? Is, is, it, is it that you're mad that they exist and they hold you back? Is it because you want them to do more and eliminate crime because you see it so much rant. Like what's, what's your relationship with the government? What do you think they should be doing or do they bother you? We're not, we're you not getting into, we're not getting into partisan politics. Okay. The, the Antars were first generation Americans. In other words, my grandparents came here from Syria in the 1920s, both sets of grandparents. Now, as Syrian Jews, we were persecuted against the centuries living in Arab countries. And in order to survive, there were two things. We had to develop a very tight knit social structure. Okay. And number two, there was a deep distrust of government. So when people, when, when, when the Syrian Jews came to America, they kept those two items, very tight social structure and a deep distrust of government. And as time went on, 99.9% .9 of the Syrian Jews assimilated into American society, led productive lives, and didn't commit any crime. But there was a small subset that, that, you, that, that still had that deep distrust of government, right? That still had that, that, that tight family structure, and they went on to crime, and they used that to, to, to keep the, their, their, their little criminal groups cohesive. In other words, use that to keep their, their crimes under the radar because uh, we were bound together, not just by money, but by loyalty, but by, by, by family ties. And that's what kept us together as criminals. 
So I have a question that comes off of Slido. Um, you had mentioned a while ago, and I'm going to twist this or change the question up a little bit. You would mentioned a while ago that one of the reasons you think that you were able to perpetrate your fraud is because you were able to distract the men who showed up. Now in accounting, in audit particularly, we have a, a large cohort of women. Do you think you would have been able to do the same with women? I would have figured something out. Well, but let's go back to those days because this is very important. You have to talk about crime in the era it was committed. Back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there was no females in accounting. Not no, there were very few. They were called back in those days token females. That's what they were called, for better or for worse. I know we live in this woke era with all of this crap. But what are they going to do? Cancel, cancel me? Cancel me. I don't give a damn. Anyway, back in those days, there was very, very few females in, account, in accounting. Very few females attended, uh, went to a major in accounting. And there were hardly any, if any, college professors in accounting. It was a male-dominated profession. So in those days, it was relatively easy being a male myself and about to, a little slightly older. It was very, very easy to understand how the male mind works, okay? And the male mind works is that, you know, sex is distracting. The prospect of sex, the potential of sex is distracting. So that's why I would always use, the, I would always pick and choose the most beautiful ladies to always work with the auditors so it's, and let nature take its course. Because most of these guys were young males right out of college and, or, and, and there's an old saying, men think between their legs, which is true. But, but that, that doesn't quite answer the question. So, I mean, there's, oh. I've read research that suggests that COVID is being handled better by, uh, by women leaders in countries with women leaders. I think and women they, are generally smarter than men. I know that's so do, you, so, so do you think you would have actually been able to do this? You think audits are better? I mean, and also relatedly, somebody it, asked it, it's, somebody- It's a hypothetical question. I would, what I would answer you is I would have found a way to distract the women. Are, I, would are you, found, I would have found muscular bound men. You know, I would have found something to distract the woman. And, and actually the question that came off Slido was more about women doing crime. So I, I'm thinking in terms of like the Theranos, so Elizabeth Holmes, does that surprise you or do you, or was it difficult to, to recruit women into doing crime or was it easier well, to, we have to commend her for We have to commend her for breaking new ground. It used to be just a male dominated, um, it used to be a male dominated, um, sorry, I just got a, an interruption. Okay. Uh, it used to be, white collar crime used to be just a male dominion. I'm glad to see that females are finally breaking the glass ceiling and joining the ranks of white collar criminals. Do, do you have a theory I think, about I think that, I think that I think that women in general are, would be probably more effective white collar criminals than men because of the way our social structure is, the way that people uh, um, react to women compared to men. So are you surprised that we don't see more coming from women or? Maybe they're smarter and they haven't gotten caught. I think women in general are smarter than men. On that, Sam, I'll pass have it a question. Question. We have a question on Slido. On your website, you state that you train others on catching crooks today. Can you share some examples of this type of training? Well, I, I sometimes will teach an eight hour course. I taught at the FBI Academy. I taught numerous accounting schools and, and, and uh, law, law schools and uh, government entities. Um, I just, I, I go through in detail my 30 years of crime and how I did it every single step along the way. Not just like the hour that we have on this webinar. And I go into lots of detail. But the most important thing, the most important thing that you have to understand is that your humanity, the most important lesson you can learn is that your humanity, your ethics, and your morality are exploitable weaknesses for white collar criminals. The more moral you are, the more ethical you are, the more natured you are, makes, makes you an easier mark for white collar criminals because you choose to limit your behavior and white criminal criminals impose no constraints on their behavior. So come in, did you have follow or? Um, I was just going to, I was just looking at Slido, but you can um, take this one, Alan, if you need to. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to ask. So somebody asked, um, is any part of you happy that you got caught? That's a new question. I had never gotten. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, in some ways I am happy I got caught. It's, you know what it is. It's, you know, it was time to, it, it, in retrospect, it was time to move on. But, but if, I, I mean, you haven't gone into the whole story here because of time and because we're focusing on other questions, but way back when I've had you, you've discussed that you were actually trying to legitimize 
the company when you're going to go public, right? So you were doing all the skimming okay, and you're trying yeah. to go public to legitimize. So, so three, why did you continue phase, fraud? Right. There were three phases to the crazy Eddie fraud. Okay. Let's get, we'll get into the legitimization towards the end of it. The first phase was from 1969 to 1979, where we were just garden variety income tax evaders, skimmers, uh, stealing sales tax, evading income tax, paying people off the books uh, uh, to avoid payroll taxes. That gave us a competitive edge to beat everybody's prices. The second phase was the legitimization phase. Between 1979 to 1984, we, we set out to commit a securities fraud by turning legitimate. What did that mean? Well, if you, if you gradually reduce your skimming, your reported income gets higher and higher and higher by virtue of the fact that you're showing more of the dollars that you didn't show before. So if I made $10 million in one year, but I skimmed five, the world would only think I made $5 million. But if I made $10 million the following year, but I skimmed four, the world will think I made a million dollars more than the previous year, because instead of reporting 5 million income, now I'm reporting 6 million income. So we gradually reduced the skimming to zero between 1979 to 1984, which, which, which makes it appear that Crazy Eddie's is growing at a much faster trajectory than it was really growing. 1984 was the only year that reported financial statements that I would say was materially correct. So we legitimized the business and we went public and, the business, and we got a stock market valuation based upon the fact that we had this uh, growth trajectory that was inflated by virtue of the, the gradual reduction in skimming. And that was where it was supposed to end. In other words, if we had just stayed that way, we could have made 50, 60 million dollars, committed the perfect crime, and I wouldn't even be speaking to you today. You wouldn't even know I existed. You'd have me up there as one of the pillars of the corporate community instead of as a, as a, as a convicted felon. But, so know, why did why, why did it go on and why did you do like the revenue fraud and all because the, we the, felt that we, because or the inventory as as you succeed in all of these steps over the years from 1969 to 1984 you're building on 15 years of success right say so, okay let's try now inflating our income by one dollar it worked next quarter let's try inflating our income by ten dollars it worked Next quarter, let's try inflating our income by a million, and so on and so forth. You build on your prior successes. So by 1980, by 1987, 1984 to 1987, we're now a public company. We're inflating income to sell stock at inflated prices. But, but it, how, at no at no point at no point did you jump in and say, "Hey, we don't need to do this. We've got enough. Like we're legit." Yeah, there were debates. There were debates about it, of course, within the co-conspirators. But the, the but, question but of what, need what to led do you it, to continue? The question of need to do it or not to do it wasn't a moral discussion. It was a business discussion, and we felt that we could succeed because we've had we've had we had success year after year after year after year after year. You didn't but, become a professor by by just saying, "I'm going to become a professor." You built up, you went to high school, you went to college, you went to graduate school, you got your PhD, you did your papers. That's how you got to where you are today. That's how I got to where I was when I was doing a criminal. So this was a pride thing, not necessarily a greed thing. It was just hubris and pride because we could do it. So let's see what we could do. We're... Right, We're arrogance. You see, there's something called the fraud Pentagon. You should probably have one. It, 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 um, his name is Jonathan Marks where you said that, 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 that we, we don't take into account the arrogance of the white collar criminal. Arrogance. Remember, the prisons are filled with people that never planned on ending up there. Except under the current prosecution per your perspective. <laughs> anyway. Sam, I'd like to go back to the actual crimes um, that you described. We have a question from Slido. Who or what was the important accessory to the crimes that you commit, committed? Was there a specific person or persons that were um, those accessories to the crimes? Oh, there was a group of people. There was Eddie, his, his father was, a, was, was the co-founders of the company. Then we had Eddie's brothers, Alan and Mitchell. Uh, we had his brother-in-law, we had cousins, we had uncles, we had people that were not family. You know, depending upon how close they were to the family was the extent of their involvement in the crimes. Not everybody was involved in every single part of the crime. There were, there were plenty of co-conspirators. I, I had my accounts payable person. Uh, my, my controller was involved in it. You know, there, there, there are different people in different aspects of it. 
So who would you who would you say had the most indelible impression on your life in terms of teaching you how to manipulate um, people? Because this, you know, of course, it's me, a family it enterprise. Me, me, it went naturally because that was the world that I was brought up in. To me, it was natural. But I'll give you the so, flip side. Who had, who had the best impression on my life uh, post-Crazy Eddie was probably the FBI people. Because you know how they, not how they solved the case? They weren't ideologues. They were pragmatic guys that were non-judgmental who knew how to manipulate my behavior and get me to cooperate and give them more than what they bargained for. So, go ahead. Um, no, I was just going to pick up a question from Slido. Someone was, but you can you can go ahead, Alan. No, you, no, go 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 ahead. I'll pick up next. Okay. Um, basically, this question is from your point of view. What are some of the basic checks that someone external to the company um, would run to uncover some of the frauds, or at least get some type of suspicion that well, something they didn't give is wrong? Basic checks. I'll give you an idea. In 19, 1986, we took we took six we took we took two million dollars in cash and put it back into the company, right before year end to inflate our sales to inflate our comparable store sales our same store sales to inflate our profits. Okay, we put the money into the company, we put the comp money into the company in 1986. Right now, the money was actually put into the company on Monday, and this and the fiscal year ended on a Sunday because the banks used to be closed on Saturdays and Sundays. So the money was recorded as, 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 as debit cash, credit sales. But on the bank statement, it wouldn't show up because the money wasn't deposited until Monday. What auditors typically do is known as, as a cutoff test, where they examine deposits in transit. They determine if revenue was pulled forward or backwards. Revenue from the, from, the, from the following year was pulled into the current year and backwards and forwards. They didn't do that key procedure. Why? Because of distraction. They were too busy looking at the females trying to get the first base. They didn't have time to do that key order procedure. In 1987, our accounts payable was $70 million and we, and we understated it by $20 million by issuing false debit memos, false chargebacks to vendors. The auditors failed to do what was known as, as um, an accounts payable aging schedule to see how long accounts payable was outstanding for how long it took us to pay back accounts payable. If they'd done an accounts payable schedule, accounts payable aging schedule, they would have been able to determine that Crazy Eddie's overstated its income by $20 million by understating its liabilities. Year after year after year, the auditors missed key audit procedures because we distracted them. Because the fraud, the distraction is always more important than the lie. So I'm, I'm going to move that forward a little bit. Now we've got all this technology and it's both a blessing and a curse. And so now we can do things like data analysis of the entire accounts. And now, as, as I recall the story, um, you guys were distracting auditors and somebody was actually penciling in in the ledger specific new numbers. Is that correct? Yeah, but fraud evolves over time. You know, it, it, the, the techniques I used in 1969 to 1984 might not be. Some of them might not be valid today. But, but, do, you, but do you thing, think? Do you think some of the computer technology that we have, like blockchain, to evaluate, you know, cash and et cetera? I mean, do you think that stuff is going to help or not enough? There's always ways around it. Computer technology was stopping fraud. How can we have so many more hackers today and so much more uh, cyber crime? You know, it's a war. It's a. It's a. It's an ongoing war. You know, the, the, the criminals get smarter, the people fighting the criminals get smarter. Then the criminals get smarter again and the people fighting crime get smarter again. It's, not, it's never gonna change. Uh, the, the techniques might change, the methods might change, but crime will always be there. Okay. So coming from Slido, um, this gets into your psychology. Why are you doing the presentation? Here, what, what compelled you to 11, do this? It's 11 inches of snow and I can't do anything else in this damn pandemic, that's why. So you're just bored to hang out with us? I'm just bored. Actually, you, <laughs> actually, you called me up, you asked me to do it. I said, okay, I like Alan, so I'm doing it. Oh, okay, so it's just for me. This is all to entertain me. That's all for you, that's all okay. for you. Well, I appreciate that. I don't know why we have visitors then, um, but okay, Burton, go ahead. I don't know how to follow um, that up. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift directions a bit. This 
question is from Slido. What do you think is the next big fraud on the horizon? I was Samuel. thinking, I, I would, it's a hard question to, to hone down very specifically on, but I look at the electron, electric vehicles, the electric vehicles industry. I look at multi-level marketing. I look at China-based companies and I see, and I can like, I can almost taste the fraud by just looking, by just looking at a computer screen. I mean, um, there, there are areas that I would, I would, uh, you know, uh, especially electronic vehicles. It was a company called, um, I really don't want to get into it with, with, with stocks, but there was a few, there was, let's put it this way. There's a, there's a lot of suspicious activity out there. But, but you, you threaded a whole bunch of different, you know, like you said, auto, and then you said China, and then you said, but they're not oh, connected, China, right? Let's look at China. You can't, they, they can't even, the, the, the um, That's the, an enforcement um, issue, right? The China's PCAOB an AOB can't even review the audits out of China. Okay, yeah, okay, that's an so enforcement no, reach issue, right? transparency and accountability there. And the big four accounting firms, they're not really, they're using their affiliates in China, not really the big four accounting firms themselves. They're using these Chinese affiliated firms that are, that are borrowing their names. Uh, as far as as far as as far as electric electric vehicles, uh, I mean, you got some companies that have, have a far bigger valuation than 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 the established companies that are developing electric vehicles as a whole. Uh, you have uh, you have companies that are worth tens of billions of dollars on what on a piece of paper with a drawer. It's 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 effing insane. Yeah, but but isn't that just irrationality on the market? I mean, you know, people are looking ahead and they're saying, "Hey, we're you know, electronics the way to go. We're moving off of oil." And, and you know, you selling think- false selling false hope is fraud too. I mean, I could put a pencil. But I got this great idea here. Here it is out there. I got it. Yeah, on. but that's that's an intangible asset, right? Well, people are people are putting a lot of putting a lot of valuation into intangible assets and tangible ideas. But I, I guess, is it their naivete or are they being misled? And there's, there's a difference. I mean, it could be both, right? Uh, yeah, it could be a little bit of both. You're right. So somebody, somebody asked, and I, I kind of know the answer, but have you considered doing a documentary or being part of a movie? You have an interesting character. Uh, Hollywood has been trying to do a movie on crazy Eddie's. The problem is, you, you know, I'm a, probably the most handsome white collar criminal that there ever was and very, very hard to find somebody with my good looks. Uh, so why don't they ask you that? It's a little bit, but uh, there, will be a, there will be a Crazy Eddie movie or maybe perhaps a miniseries because now with the streaming and everything else, with the, with the shift away from movie theaters to streaming, um, there, there probably will be a Crazy Eddie movie. So it's going to be like The Crown on Netflix? Who knows? Who knows? But um, Netflix now charges too much money, so I hope it wouldn't be Netflix, but who knows? <laughs> All right, Burton, you have a follow-up? Or? I guess. I mean, it's just a piggyback from what you said, Alan. Um, someone asked on Slido, so what do you enjoy more, the secretive nature of committing fraud or the fame from committing the fraud? Both. Equally. Oh, that's impossible to determine, but both. Okay. Um, I'm going to take another question from Slido. Would there have been anything that would have caused you to stop your actions back no. in the day? No, it was the heroic actions of the, of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Securities and Exchange Commission. In those days, prosecutors had balls. Today, they don't. Uh, it was their heroic actions that uh, that stopped me from committing crime. If you want to believe that, I've stopped. So you still have relationships with them, right? I mean, you still talk to the prosecutors. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I have relationships with the former SBI people that came in. I think actually one of the SEC lawyers, one of the top SEC lawyers on the case, follows me on Twitter. And I pick on him every once in a while just to remind him. And, and what's the purpose of you being on Twitter? What do you have to say on Twitter? Well, Twitter, I originally went on Twitter to quit smoking. And <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> because you, you, you get anxiety, you got to get it off your chest so you tweet instead of smoking the cigarette. Yeah, but that's, that's but dangerous. Smoking, Impulsive Twitter like, is a bad idea. 
Right. I, I eventually, I, I eventually, I eventually uh, quit smoking, but uh, I stayed with Twitter because of other things like like the incompetent government we have here in New York City that's driving me effing insane. Okay, that's a path I'm not sure we want to go down. Yeah. No. <laughs> Sam, there's a question on Slido. What industry has the most fraud, in your opinion? Oh, I don't know. The, the, I would say if you were to look at general areas, and don't ask me specifics, because I don't want to get involved with stocks or whatever. Look at China-based companies. Uh, look at uh, the multi-level marketing industry. Look at electronic vehicles. Uh, also, uh, Bitcoin, which is, the, which is the currency of thieves. Uh, you can look at that, that too. So are, are you able to? Good. I was just going to ask: Are you able to shed some more light about Bitcoin and you know your apprehension for the use of that currency? Uh, I really cannot shed more light because I'm not into Bitcoin. I'm more of a mattress criminal. Me, I stored my loot in my mattress. I don't believe in the, any kind of electronic currencies. I'm only kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Alan. I really don't have anything else to say about Bitcoin. So, so was there any part of the, like you, you did multiple levels of crime. Um, so you were doing like skimming and then you were doing money laundering and were, were any of them more worrisome to you than others? Like were any of them like easier to detect or anything that kind of you were afraid of or were they all just interrelated and you thought you pulled it off? Well, income tax evasion was quite easy. To be honest with you, it's like almost like a risk-free proposition. And even today where the IRS, I think we have less IRS criminal uh, investigative division agents than we had 20, 30 years ago. Is that it's because you were doing cat? Is that because you were doing cash sales or is, or is that yeah, in general? Cash sales. I mean, it disappears. How, how but, do you but, find but nobody's doing cash today, right? So no, I mean, well, that, that's a problem. But back in those days, that was the big thing was the cash okay. sales. So income tax evasion. Uh, money laundering was probably the most exciting. Uh, especially known as the Panama pump, where we took money from the Antar bank accounts that was previously skimmed before we went public, we had put back into the company after we went public. That was probably the sexiest crime that I ever committed. And why uh, did you do that? fraud was a little bit much more difficult, but challenging, uh, required a lot more skills and a lot more moving pieces. But then again, we didn't get caught. The reason that we got caught was because somebody believed our bullshit. You see, Back in 1987, three years into being a public company, consumer electronics started becoming more commoditized to the point that it was affecting our top line. In other words, that TV set that, for example, would sell for $500 now sold for $250. So we have to sell twice as many units to have the same overall volume, so to speak. That's just an illustrative example. So what happened was by 1987, whereas before we went public, we were understating income, and after we went public, we were overstating income. In 1987, we weren't overstating income. We were understating losses. In other words, we were reporting losses, maybe understating them. And the stock took a dive. And somebody, uh, um, this group of investors, looked at Crazy and said, this is a great opportunity to get in on the goose that laid the golden egg. It's going to come back. So they went, they bought, they took over the company by buying enough stock and throwing us out of the company. Right, thinking that Crazy Eddie was the goose that laid the golden egg. In other words, we never got caught audits, anything. Nobody ever caught us. And then when they took over the company, they realized that things weren't what they seemed based upon their reading of the financial statements. They relied upon the integrity of audits. They relied upon the, uh, the, the process. They thought that when, when we said we were making $10, we were making $10. We weren't. <laughs> you know, th that's kind of like, that's what happened to us. So after they took over the company, that's when they found the fraud. And that's when the shit started hitting the fan. And, and you were actually panicking at that. Because I, as I recall, you actually, guys, you tried to create a bid to take the company private yes, before that, to, right? we tried to buy back our own fraud. Now, why would we do that? Why would we bid $7 a share knowing that Crazy A's was worthless at that point? Because we weren't going to use our own money. We were going to get money from Wall Street. They were going to fund the entire purchase, give us 35% of the company for nothing, right? And then we can play games as a private company, take it, you know, take it private, you know, you know, go into maybe bankruptcy, you know, a little bit because when you're private, you're under the radar. Maybe we can we can play we can play forever games, but we never got to that point because somebody bid eight dollars a share, one dollar a share more than we were willing to pay for our own fraud. Sam, on the point. 
on so the point that you our own criminal success. Go ahead. Sam, on the point that you made about the um the, the takeover, the person buying the company finding out that all wasn't what it seemed to be. Do you think that in this case with Sabine's Oxley, do you think that's a useful tool um today? Or what's your views on that? Well, Sarbanes Oxley did do one key thing that we used. In other words, that was one key uh, technique that we used to, uh, def to uh, defraud investors. See, back in the 1980s, accounting firms were allowed to use do consulting services for the same client. So what they invariably did was they would underprice the audits so they can sell the high margin consulting services. It was kind of like um, it was kind of like a loss leader audits. So our audits would only cost us about sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. But we, 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 we but we would engage them to do consulting services for an extra half a million dollars a year. And that what that did was it eroded their professional cynicism because they looked at Crazy Eddie's more like a consulting customer and were willing probably in their own minds, more likely to believe our lies and our bullshit stories that whatever we told them, they were less cynical of whatever we told them. Sarbanes-Oxley, at least one thing it did was, it said that you cannot do consulting work for your audit client. That's why audit fees went up initially under Sarbanes-Oxley because they couldn't, do, they couldn't make it up on the consulting services. So Sarbanes-Oxley would have made our frauds more difficult. Would have stopped it? Probably not. We would have found a way around it. We would, we, would, we would have always found a way. So one question that pops up when, when people criticize the audit itself, and this is something we've discussed in our coursework, they talk about the failure to find the Carillion scandal or the failure to find the Wirecard scandal and, and, and that they should be held accountable. And I know I'm putting aside your comments and your thoughts on audit for the moment. The issue is I'm wondering how many, audit, how many actual frauds or how many things do they actually get right that we don't see? Say it differently, we only see the bad outcomes and we're not seeing them that frequently. So maybe they're actually doing good work well, if they were and we're not outcomes, seeing the good work. There'd be more resignations of auditors. We don't see that. But but are they, so, so uh, uh, maybe, let, let me rephrase it a little bit differently. How, what's the proportion of actually fraudulent firms you think? And let's just talk like US and UK type environment. I mean, is it, is it do you any guess? Done Alan, there were studies done years ago, and you can look it up on the internet, so my numbers might not be precise, where they, they actually asked CFOs if they've ever been pressured to overstate income or to uh, exaggerate their numbers. I think like 60 or more than 50% said yes at one point in their lives they were. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's impossible to make. See, the problem with white-collar crime is, unlike murders where you just count the dead bodies, white-collar crime is very, very difficult to measure whether it's going up or really going down. Uh, or, or the effect that any of these laws or law enforcement have on it. Uh, it's just difficult. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably true in all crime. Because I guess I'm just wondering, you know, we're maligning, so, so out there, ignoring your perspective for a moment, there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of scrutiny on auditors. And I, and I suspect that it's actually well-placed and that the audit profession entirely needs to rethink how it's going to operate. But I'm wondering, you know, are they not getting enough credit for what they are doing correct? That's one of my questions. Probably because not. We, because we don't see, like, we're not seeing an we're not seeing an audit failure all the time, and maybe it's because the fraud is just being so well hidden. Here's the question. Here's the thing that I would ask you, and it's not trying to you know play games, asking sure. uh, answering a question with a question, is that why not instead of doing the impossible, which is really improving the audit profession to do have a major cut in frauds, why don't we stop using the word audits altogether and call them what they really are, limited reviews. This way, investors won't have that false sense of security, okay? Uh, you know, let the buyer beware, so to speak, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, but they're still, but, you know, you're still going to get these hyperinflated, then, then these, these superinflated values that you're talking well, about are, are, is naivety, right? Why is the reason that know. short sellers are able to catch frauds, like you said, Wirecard and some of these other ones, is because they go, they do things that auditors are unwilling and unable to do based upon the professional constraints. In order to can't call up uh, Eddie Antar's ex-wife and ask her to spill the beans on her ex-husband, okay? Remember, the three major, the three, the most fraud, more than 50% of fraud 
is, is caught by tips. And those tippers are ex-lovers, ex-business associates, and, ex and, and, and ex-embedded employees, okay? And, and auditors don't usually contact these kind of people and ask them, why did you leave? What's going on here, et cetera. Short sellers do, they hire private investigators. I used to do a lot of work with the class action law firms. I used to do a lot of work even with the whistleblower, you know, the, with the whistleblower practices. They, would, they had no problem hiring former FBI guys to contact uh, potential people that, that were gonna rat out the current management. Because it's always somebody with, 90% of whistleblowers aren't altruistic people. They have people with axes to grind, trying to get back at people for whatever perceived slight that may have, that, that, they, 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 that may have happened to them. They're not able to do that. So the reality is, is that auditors, again, gets back to your humanity and your morality limits your behavior. Well, auditors' professional ethics, their, their, their profession limits their ability to, 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 to ferret it out for, because they can't go to distance that short sellers are willing to do. So there's a question off Slido. Um, what's your opinion about governments? So this is actually really tied to the bank crisis, in, in fact. So after that, that crisis, you've got governments backstopping debt and, and basically bailing out these entities. What do you think about that? Is that stealing hard, from the larger population? Or? It's a political question and an economic question. It's also a crime question. It's all in one. Uh, the crime policy question, of course, is we shouldn't bail out companies for bad behavior. But then you have the economic question: Is it too? If, if we allow, if we allow Chase Manhattan Bank or you know, J.P. Morgan Chase or uh, uh, Bank of America to fall, what, what is the effect on our economy? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of like this: uh, the crazy Eddie prosecutor's name was Michael Chertoff, right? Uh, he eventually was instrumental in getting um, the in dissolving Arthur Anderson. So instead of having a big five, we now have a big four. Are we better off with a big four than a big five? You know, uh, did, did, did he have to, did he have to, did, did, did a 100,000 plus person firm have to be completely disbanded because of the actions of maybe a couple of dozen people within that firm? So it's, it's, it's difficult. There's, there's no right or wrong answer to it. I can understand all sides of the argument. I have a question, Sam. Um, during the course, we spend a lot of time debating how can the audit profession improve the overall quality. Um, one of the things that came out of a few of discussions during the, our classes was the fact that the UK audit regulator, the FRC, um, has mandated that you know auditors should work towards separating the audit business by I think mid 2024. And this would involve publishing their own PLs separate from the overall firm. Do you think that this would help to reduce conflicts of interest and boost the quality of audits? It'll help, but I don't know how much it'll help. The problem is it all goes down to people. Who are the people doing the audits? How are they conducting themselves? Are they lazy? Are they not? Do they have the tools needed to do their jobs? Are the criminals smarter from them despite having all the tools to do their jobs? These are questions that you or I cannot answer, okay? But the one thing that, that, that's constant today compared to 30 years ago, we're still putting relatively inexperienced people to do most of the legwork on words, and that has to stop. But one of the things that came out of our discussions was the fact that, you know, I would give you some credit that some of the issues in some of the other scandals that at least I've observed had junior persons working, but artists still needed to be signed off by partners. Yeah, but the, so is the, it, a, the so is it, one, one second, is it, work. so is it, a, is it a question of professional skepticism not being exercised diligently, or is there an, another issue that would contribute to that? The guy that signs off on it, the senior guy with the 20 years experience, okay, all right, He's still at the mercy of the information that's fed to him by people that are a lot younger and a lot more inexperienced than he is. And they may miss red flags that he would have caught if he had his boots on the ground. It's still that problem. We need, you know, right now, too much of the audit work today is done. Too much of the legwork is done. 
my kids may be three, one, two, three, five years out of college, and that has to stop. We need more professional people. We need more people in their 40s and 50s and 60s with bald heads and gray hair. But some of this is, isn't necessarily experience. It's scope, isn't it? I mean, you know, it is scope. Yes. How, how much money are we going to spend on an audit? And how much so, data are we going to run through the audit? And, and at what point are yeah, we satiated? But, but, and I mean, but nobody, but the profession isn't talking about um, the three X's, X lovers, X business associates, X employees. They're not talking about contacting them. They're not talking about. No, but the audit, the audit committees could be right. Well, not so. I mean, the audit committees no, are set. some audit internal audit, some audit committees are setting up whistleblower hotlines and creating incentive structures, right? I mean, so, I mean, there is some infrastructure, I think. Yeah. So, so okay, let me, let, me, let me place you on the board. You're on the board of directors of a Fortune 500 company. What are you changing? Me, first of all, I wouldn't be stupid enough to be the director of any Fortune 500 company. I don't want the liability policy all of them. Even if, even if I'm covered for insurance, I don't need the aggravation in my life. You wouldn't, you turned down a relevant question. I wouldn't even be in the, I would not be a, I'm not being, first of all, I'm barred from being an officer director of a company anyway, but I would never put myself in that position. You got to be the biggest schmuck in the world to be a director of a public company. Can you elaborate why? Because there's too much shit that can go wrong. You know, it did not enough money to pay me. But you just got done talking about how there's no liability for anything going wrong, right? I mean, yeah, boy, wait, wait. There's criminal liability and then there's civil liability. Then there's aggravation liability. Then there's time liability. Okay. There's different types of there's different types of things that, that we all have stomachs for. Me at my age at 63 years old, I don't have the stomach to spend to do depositions and, and justify the good things or the smart things or the right things that I didn't try to sh- sh- show an opposing lawyer that I didn't do anything that was negligent as a director. I don't have the time for that. It's not just a question of going to jail or not. It's a question of aggravation and the time that's involved. It's not just going, you know, it's not just whether you go to jail or not. There's a lot of factors that are involved in these things. Okay, let me change it then a little bit. Now, now you're taking an auditor perspective. Actually, you're not even an auditor. You're sitting outside the company. You're looking at their financial reports. You're looking from the outside. You're not even involved in the audit. And yet you're able to identify what you perceive to be as fraud when they're not. So what are you picking up on? What are the things you're looking at and how are you identifying them? Like what kind, if, if you're, if you're coming through and I know you've said, read foot, read, read financial reports backwards to front. I know that's how you work. You work in the footnotes, but like, what's, what are the flags you're picking up? How do you know there's a fraud when you, how do you smell it? Cause you mentioned that word. I smell a fraud. Like, what are you seeing? Well, I, I've done, I won't mention the company, but I did a recent whistleblower case. Okay. Where we looked at a company's financial statements, and we look for irregularities uh, in the patterns of in, in the patterns of the numbers they were reporting, and we saw that the company had um, uh, it, it, it's um, it was taking longer and longer and longer to turn over inventory. It was taking longer and longer and longer to get paid on its revenues. So we said, and based upon this analysis, like a hundred-page analysis, we submitted it to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we say that the company overstated its income by, I'm just throwing out an illustration number because I don't want to identify the company, Mm -hmm. uh, which is about $50 million. We said that $40 million of it came from overstating revenues and say $10 million came from overstating inventory. And the SEC investigated the company. They they read our financial analysis and voila, the company ended up overstating its income not by the 50 million we predicted, but by 53 million. Actually, the stock went up afterwards. So just to show you that even the stock market will reward, will reward fraud. And uh, what did we do? We, we looked, we, we did just straight fundamental uh, accounting, financial accounting 101 or 1001 analysis on the company. And you know, the question is, why didn't the auditors do the same analysis we did as outsiders? Now, we eventually won a whistleblower reward for it. Thank you very much for the check, even though I gotta get 40% of the United States government. It kills me to have to pay taxes after 20 years of evading taxes of crazy eddies. It kills me, but I'll do it anyway. But anyway, but um, why, 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 why were we able to catch it? Why? Why? What were the auditors? 
So what happens? Uh, the, 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 a few of the auditors were suspended for a couple of years. Okay, fine, and they had to pay a hundred thousand dollars of fine, and whatever. And uh, and, and uh, you know they'll probably be back in the. They're probably back practicing accounting today. The company's stock has been higher than it ever was. I got my reward, but there was you know that, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, were there consequences? Yeah, there were some consequences. You know, me, I wouldn't want to, you know, uh, even though you don't go to jail, me at 63 years old, I don't want to commit crime to, to deal with the bullshit that comes along with it, you know, even if I can avoid prison. So, but there were some people, there were some consequences, and that was it. Done. Okay. So, Burton, you got a question, or should I get a slide up? Um, I just have one question. I just wanted to get back to the point you made concerning the audit program design as a possible root cause for poor audit quality. So let's assume that you are in a position to influence um, audit policy, maybe being maybe being working working with the FRC. Other than having um, more audit firm executives being involved. What are some of the other changes you would recommend if you could influence the way audits are designed? What would you improve on? Listen, I could tell you a thousand and one things, okay? I could tell you there should be an auditor watching everything that goes on at the company to the, to the, to the total extreme. I could tell you that, that in every meeting with the accounting people, there should be an outside auditor monitoring what's going on, okay? The question is what's economical? Okay, what, what, what's realistic, what can be done? It's very, very difficult to do. My, my solution to the problem is as follows. Let's not waste any more time and stop calling audits audits. Let's call them limited reviews. Let the investors beware. Let them understand that, that audits are not going to catch fraud and audits will have a very limited, if any, protection from fraud and let the chips fall where they may. I give, you a million more, I give you a million more things. Okay, why don't we just confirm every single invoice and accounts received all hundred million dollars, all one hundred billion dollars worth for, for a Fortune five hundred company? I mean, at what point does it stop? Yeah, but it data with some of the data techniques and tools we have, we can actually look for outliers. So, so now we can collect yeah, all the data, I, run it I've through. Been I mean, successful in catching some of those outliers, yeah. okay, yeah. As, as, as doing whistleblower cases. But at the same time, how many how many how many outliers are missed? We don't know. Yeah, no, that's fair. We don't know. Okay, so somebody somebody just came in, and I'm going to answer this question. You don't have to. Are you getting Are you getting paid to speak today? And the answer is no. We we don't pay Sam. I don't think I've paid Sam in 15 years that we've engaged you. So you're not getting besides, paid. I'll, besides, I wouldn't know anyway because I only take cash. I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to. Paid. I'm not I'd have to fight over. Um, okay, so so somebody asked, are you able to identify what your purpose is in life and what makes you sleep well at night? That's an interesting yes. question to your psychology. Because as you get older, you become more stingy with your time. And my time right now is I my time right now is that I spend my time with, with my immediate family and I spend my time feeding the geese at, at the park. That's my time right now. I teach once in a while, I'm pretty much retired at this point in life. I have no more desires to uh, do any more major cases anymore. I have no more desires to, uh, to to do any more whistleblower cases. I have no more desires to be hired by anybody. At this point in life, I'm just coasting it in and relaxing because I, I've seen too much going on in the last year between pandemics, between everything that's going on. You know, I just want to, I just, whatever life I have left, uh, I want to spend as much quality time as possible. Okay, Burton, I think we're, we're coming out of time, so I'm going to let you ask the last question. Um, okay, this is going to be a random one. Then. Hey, ask me 10 random questions. Go ahead. <laughs> um, someone asked, earlier you said you grew up with fraud all around you. What was your childhood like, and what were the people like around you when you were younger? Well, you know, like kids play cops and robbers. I always played the robber when I was a kid. Uh, uh, what do you call it? You see, I started working from when I was 12 years old. I actually worked for Crazy Eddie's dad, 
who was the founder of Crazy A's in one of his other businesses. And at 14 years old, they ended up working for Eddie's dad and Eddie when I moved over to Crazy Eddie's. Uh, for me, it was just the way of life. That was the way life was. Life was doing business and, and committing crime. That was the life that I led. That was wired into me from a very, very, very young age. It was part of my culture, so to speak, as a, within the world that I was living in. And what, what's, what's the relationship with the family now? I know Eddie passed away, and I, there's a CNBC video of you guys meeting for the first time after 20 well, Eddie years. Eddie passed away. Um, uh, Eddie's brother still haven't forgiven me for turning state's witness against the company. Uh, Eddie's sister and brother-in-law were on good terms with uh, whatever. I mean, um, pretty much, you know, that part of the family I don't have much uh, association with. Um, most recently, one of the co-conspirators, Eddie's brother, Alan's son, was indicted on charges of defrauding investors. His name was Sam Antar, like I'm Sam Antar, he's Sam A. Antar, and I'm Sam E. Antar. Uh, people were calling me up, did you get in trouble again? Did you start doing crime again? I said, no. I, re I remember asking you that when it I was saw one that. guy, not me, not me, not me, whatever. So... Actually, me, I'm just have... a grumpy, just me. I'm just a grumpy old retired fellow. I, I do have actually one one question that came in, um, and, and this actually goes into sort of the course that I teach, which is about the value of the financial reporting system entirely. Like when I talk to financial reg or financial accounting standard centers, we discuss, for example, that intangible assets we don't even record them pretty much. It very rarely do they actually show up, and now we're moving into sort of non non-financial factors showing up in these reports like ESG and, 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 and climate, stuff like that. Is, is there value still to financial reporting? I mean, are investors actually learning from them? Or are they going outside? Some information is better than no information, but the question really is, are we overvaluing financial reporting? Are we taking into account the risks and limitations of the current financial framework? And that same thing goes to auditing, okay? I could tell you a million things we can do to improve audits or not improve, you know, the, the, real, the real issue with I think today that we benefit everybody as a whole is that we have an education as to limitations of financial reporting, what it can and cannot do. And part of it is, and I'll go back to the same thing, get rid of the word audits because audits, as most people think of them, don't really exist. So, so Burton, I promised you the last question, and I slid one in. Do you have a follow up or? No, 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 I'm okay. Okay, well, Sam, I I really appreciate the time uh, spending with us today, and and I want to make it clear to the audience that again, this is Sam's perspective on things, and it doesn't necessarily reflect our opinions. But I do think it's helpful for the audience to actually hear your perspective on the framework, and then also a little bit of your story and how you've evolved in your lifetime since the crime. So I really appreciate that you being, you've been willing to share that with us, and then we'll have to individually evaluate whether we actually believe anything you said, which that's, I think is part, which I think is part of your point. That's the whole thing. I want you to think. I'm not here to sell you on Sam Antar being a nice guy, Sam Antar being reformed, or Sam Antar being remorseful. It's quite irrelevant. The question is whether you are thinking, whether you understand the, limit, the limitations of morality and ethics, whether you understand limitations on what, what the rules and procedures and all the things that you think protect you, really understanding the limitations to which they can and cannot protect you. Well, I do appreciate your time. Thank you for spending your snowy day with us and take care Anytime. and stay safe and avoid Bye -bye. COVID. And thank you, thank you everybody for hanging out with us on uh, YouTube, the live stream. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thanks everybody. Stay